Hi, I'm Jeremy Kirk with Intel 471, and welcome to Studio 471, which is our regular video interview series. My guest is Deanna Selk Paulson, who's the lead security researcher at Orange Cyber Defense. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about cyber extortion and hacktivism because Orange Cyber Defense has done some interesting research into this area. Thank you very much for joining me, Deanna. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you got into InfoSec and what Orange Cyber Defense does. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think my background is not so uh, so common. Uh, I come actually from social science. Uh, I have a master's degree in international criminology. Uh, I think my uh, interest in cyber became, I had already before. Uh, I did a bachelor in socioeconomics, so focusing in sociology. And in sociology, it's, you know, you look a little bit into yeah, society and change, and then you can't really ignore the change of you know, technical transformation or digitalization. So I became a bit, a bit hooked uh, that, like how do we use it as a society where the generational gaps and then um, continuing into into my master's in criminology, I, I somehow, or not somehow, I naturally focused on uh, antisocial behavior, um, deviant behavior online and employment and cyber crime. So um, yeah, that's my background. And I think, you know, uh, cyber security, cyber tech, cyber crime have a lot in common. So I think it's actually very useful to have that background uh, these days. Yeah, and you wrote uh, you wrote something on LinkedIn that I thought was really interesting. It was about how organizations often come to you and they ask how the threats that are facing them fit into the experience of the overall threat landscape. So sort of like is what we're is what we're experiencing the same as I guess others? Or so what kind of answer do you give? those organizations, and especially because you probably know the background of their sort of security incidents and defense postures mm -hmm. and things like that? Yeah, sometimes I do. Um, so, you know, I started in, uh, in IT security in operations. So I received that question a lot from our customers. Now I have moved on to security research. So then I, I still receive that, that question from our customers, um, but I don't have that insight any longer because I'm focusing a lot on the external threat landscape. But I think both both um, bring valuable insights, let's say it like this. Um, I just sometimes wonder, so if it, the question makes sense to me, you know, as a, a customer, I would want to know uh, what's going on, you know, in the threat landscape, what's going on in my in my grouping, uh, let's say, so by industry, by geographic region. But then if you if you look very closely, if you zoom in, I'm wondering sometimes what does that actually mean, you know? Because if you if you go to the micro level uh, and look at each organization in a specific group, industry group, um, no organization is alike, of course. No? Uh, everyone has their different setup, different environment, different assets that are, you know, um, being threatened or not. So then, then you wonder, and in, you know, in criminology, we actually look at uh, victim variables there. So um, can we determine victim variables that determines the likelihood for an organization to become victim? Uh, and we have something that's called VIVA, um, and each letter stands for a variable. So VIVA would mean V is um, vulnerability. So, you know, what are my vulnerabilities? What are my practices that make me vulnerable? Um, so like mistakes I'm making or things I'm not observing or uh, monitoring. Uh, VIVA, so uh, I, inertia. Uh, inertia means can we add some weight or noise to something that can be stolen from me? Because if you go back in offline crime uh, and look at theft, because we're looking a lot at data theft these days, yes. um, you know, back then, if you would steal a physical object, um, it would be big uh, and it would be visible. But data is to some degree not very visible. So how can we add some weight to that? Uh, to make it more difficult to steal, basically. Uh, Viva, the second V is then value. What does uh, an asset or data, um, what value does it have to us as an organization? Not to the threat actors, but to us, because that uh, unfortunately brings the leverage to a threat actor to extort us based on, on the value it has to us, the sensitive information. And then Viva A uh, is um, access, uh, and then 
access is not meant to to ask the question how can we avoid someone accessing our systems without you know authority in that sense but more how can we how can we shorten that period because if we would be able to completely avoid it we wouldn't be talking today and we wouldn't you know see see the cyber crime that we're seeing today but how can we shorten um shorten the time and also like the space that can move towards to no? um so all those variables are super helpful to actually look at an organization but they are difficult when you want to make a comparison within you know the threat landscape but then what else we could do is if we accept that you know that fact that it's difficult to compare organizations within one industry could we maybe zoom out and say an industry does have specific char characteristics um, that might still determine any organi organization that is within that industry so for example i just came across a report from denmark actually they looked into manufacturing and ransomware and it's one of the big questions that we also have why manufacturing you know we've seen yes, them, like one third almost or 25 percent um, of all you know victims that we are documenting are from manufacturing and then um, in manufacturing, you then they actually found uh, the sub industries, food manufacturing and chemical manufacturing. So pharmaceutics and um, even like makeup and, and so on. Um, and those have critical functions, of course, you know, uh, food manufacturing, creating yes. food, making food to have critical functions. So then the characteristic of that industry becomes a factor, you know, that that might determine the likelihood to become a victim as well. Um, and then to zoom out even more, uh, what is happening in the world, you know, geopolitical events, and especially now since 2022, since the war against Ukraine began, we can actually say, you know, in case of ransomware, for example, it's not purely financially motivated anymore. It's also it can turn very quickly into politically um, motivations, and then that might determine why. So, um, yeah, I think there are a lot of factors to look at, but we often stay within the comparison of industry and region, which, depending on yes. what you're looking for, uh, yes. might be useful or not. <laughs> And so from, a, from a, like a criminologist perspective, what do you think we're getting mm -hmm. wrong about ransomware? You know, there's been mm -hmm. action plans by comp uh, different countries to crack down on cryptocurrency and do law enforcement investigations and to build resiliency among organizations. But, you know, last year was by far the worst. Um, this year is <laughs> this year's only March and we're not doing we're not going very well with ransomware this year either. Is there something that stands out that you think that we're missing in this? Mm -hmm. um, difficult, difficult to say because I actually think it's very complex, and I think that might be already the answer to that. You know, to not not just be so specific about ransomware as looking at it as a technical issue and trying to talk that with technical controls, really, but to to look at this um, from from several sides, uh, so to say. And I had a, I had a really interesting uh, experience this weekend, which has nothing to do with ransomware, but maybe um, it will help me make my point. Um, I was uh, just discussing discussing the weather with some friends, um, <clears throat> and uh, we were looking at the sky, and it was actually indeed sunny. And uh, you know, the weather report didn't really say whether or not the sun would come out or not. And a friend of mine said, "Well, you need to look at the electricity prices." Um, to see whether or not the sun is going to come out or not, because that would oh, impact right. you know, the prices of electricity. And I had such a big aha moment, because I think this is exactly what we should be doing with ransomware. And I think that what, what we're doing, at least, is to look from this at a different point of view. So, I mean, we, for example, as many others, I collect data on victimology uh, at the very end of what has happened, you know, ransomware. Yes. Um, and we gain a lot of insights, but again, it's a very reactive way of, of doing that. And I think our industry, you know, have, has been trying to proactively, it's like this big word, uh, uh, to proactively try to 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 uh, fend, defend or fight uh, ransomware, but it's a, it's a difficult one. And um, if we start zooming out to say, okay, maybe we shouldn't look at this only as a technical problem, because we've been trying this for many, many years and we haven't gotten yes. better. 
uh, actually, as we're looking at it now, we're seeing much more ransomware. It's much more known, it's much more, you know, impactful because it's impacting many more private organizations uh, and public public organizations. But then again, is it because we have more transparency because something actually fundamentally changed in 2020? Uh, when they did start double extortion and we're yes. actually now looking at extortion um, and not just ransomware uh, so do we see more you know and that's why we we think we see an increase or is it actually an increase so what i i find really interesting in your security navigator report which just came out um uh, i think a couple of months ago mm -hmm. um you counted the number of law enforcement actions against uh cybercrime players. Uh, mm -hmm. you, most of it was focused on cyber extortion. Um, you know, we saw other actions too against um, Genesis Market, which was uh, that sort of initial access brokering um, kind of bot market. Um, and But the conclusion is that we've got still rising cybercrime, but we've got more mm -hmm. actions probably than ever. It was, I think it was 102 actions over two and a half years. Um, but the report mm -hmm. kind of concluded that this was it was kind of indetermined if it was actually impacting cybercrime. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you went yeah, about looking yeah. at that? Absolutely. I think it, it comes from the question, you know, why haven't we gotten better in this? Um, and then, of course, the question is who who needs to have become better in this? But uh, if we agree that, you know, we should look uh, at ransomware as a crime, then there's a natural way of looking towards law enforcement when we talk crime, basically. Uh, and crime prevention, but also just um, disruption. Um, so we were reaching out to some peers and we were actually asking like, is anyone, you know, do we know what they do as a whole? Do we know, you know, what is what is done like everywhere in, in terms of cyber crime? And we couldn't really find anyone who would, who has done anything that or would share a data set. So we built our own uh, and uh, we, we looked through uh, media media announcements or media coverage uh, addressing cybercrime, uh, and then we would look at um, what type of cybercrime is addressed in that announcement, and what has been has been taken by law enforcement to address that type of crime. And yeah, we managed to to collect hundred two um, activities that, that we knew of. Of course, there's a lot of duplicates when you know, depending on the, the sources that you look at. Uh, so we did duplicated it, um, and we could see, you know, in, in our navigator report, you, you can see that. But if you look at the timeline from 2021 to Q3 2023, you actually see that at the end of the timeline, it has become much busier um, than just in 2021. So yes. we see more more activity in that space. Uh, and like I personally, I observe that space a lot. I also feel that, you know, I mean, you, we have now in the last four months, we've seen two big uh, disruption efforts of, of uh, cyber extortion um, operations. And actually our data set also showed that the most addressed action is cyber extortion with 15% and then others were addressed as well. And, you know, if you would have, if you would have, if we would have been talking about this, like, uh, two months ago, I would have told you um, when we looked at type of action that was taken, we've seen mostly like sentencing and arrests, like over yes. half of, of this was sentencing and arrests. And maybe that is the reason why, you know, it isn't as effective. It, it's very lengthy. It takes a lot of time and it would only take one or two people out of the whole operation. But, you know, we're looking at as a whole ecosystem really, and they can be easily uh, replaced as it seems. Absolutely. But, and in your in yeah. your research with uh, or in your expertise in sort of criminology and mm -hmm. online criminology, um, is it possible to deter people online from doing crime? And how does that differ from physical sorts of crime? Yeah, good question. And I, it goes uh, into, into uh, what I was going to say. Uh, as well. So, I mean, deterrence as a concept should work, right? So um, it should have a deterrent effect to others, uh, you know, that have seen what consequences the violator faced in, in that sense. Um, and um, I don't, I don't believe, you know, cyberspace is a lawless space. We have seen much more activity there, but of course we haven't seen so many consequences um, uh, that yes. have actually just dis disrupted. Um, but I think uh, 
looking at uh, the last activities that we've seen with Black Cat and, and Lockbit, we actually also see not only how resilient they are towards being disrupted, but also resistance. No? I mean, the last two activities uh, now in December was Black Cat, who just after a few days unseats themselves and, you know, just came back. Um, and then also not just that, but to top this, to say, okay, you know, you did this now to, to us, we're actually going to remove all the rules that we had in place and we're going to take anyone we really want to, uh, including healthcare. Um, so yes, like this, yes. almost this to toddler behavior and st stamping the food into the ground and saying, okay, I show you, you know, I show you what, what I can, what I'm capable of. Um, and then also with Lockbit, just, you know, changing the way they work, decentralizing their operations and their, their web panels and getting back back online and fully operational again. And that's because this is just so unconventional to basically have a country protect a whole criminal ecosystem, right? <laughs> Russia doesn't extradite its citizens. Russia's an international pariah now uh involved in a in a war that uh everyone opposes and uh yeah they know that they have safe haven um you know they exactly. might be under, yeah 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 they're being protected by nation states absolutely but then also when you when the question of, of deterrence i'm also thinking and we've actually conducted the research like uh almost two years ago about it uh where where we actually see that they the threat actors themselves don't consider themselves to conducting crime, you know, and then the whole question of deterrence becomes, uh, you know, they, they don't see themselves as that. And, um, you know, in criminology, we have a framework for that, and it's called neutralization techniques. Um, and we actually collected uh, over 80 negotiation sheds back then, they were actually difficult to access. Um, and we analyzed them in a qualitative way, so very social science-y, uh, and we looked at how many or do we actually find neutralization techniques applied by threat actors. And a neutralization technique could be denial of um, victimhood, you know, uh, I'm not, there is no victim, it's a victimless crime because the organization themselves, uh, they had really bad security practices. You know, oh, right. And that's a, we're doing you a favor. We did you a favor, right? Yes, You're just paying exactly. us for a you security get a test. From, <laughs> from me if you pay the ransom. Um, and then I'm helping you actually, and I'm helping society. Uh, so, is know, that, is, do, you, do you think that's a trigger that they know something's wrong and they're trying to justify it? Is that what the is that what yeah, they're doing absolutely, then? Absolutely, exactly. It's a justification oh. uh, so that they can engage in crime. So then, you know, if they don't themselves consider to actually conduct crime, then deterrence becomes also very difficult, you know, difficult concept for them to grasp because it's not what they think they're doing. And, uh, I mean, I still, I, I read uh, manifestos of, of, of the science groups still up and running and their narrative is completely different. No? They still think this is what they need to do to help society become better. That's really interesting. But you've also got a class of actors that like we'll take the DDoS people, like the guy, the, the mm. people who are running uh, booter services, uh, you know, websites that would basically you could contract to attack your competitor or attack somebody else. And I know I think that it was a, possibly the UK and the Dutch police had started running adverts on Google that if you search for DDoS booter services, you would see their advert that says, do not do this. This is a crime, right? This is really, I, I was, it's it quite encouraging, right? It's like really kind of active mm -hmm. deterrence to, and of course, you know, somebody who's looking for booter services is probably classified as like a lower level sort of cyber criminal. So do you think it like at that level, like that would be enough to, I guess, mm -hmm. scare a 17 year old to go, oh, maybe, maybe I will think twice about this before I do this. I think so, actually, because it's, it's some somewhat awareness, right, um, that this actually is, is a crime and it's a reminder. And you also just uh, reminded me, you know, um, that there was um, there was a great activity from um, two people that published the guideline on the eight rules for civilian hackers and the four obligation for nation states. I don't know if you're aware of that. It was published by the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, in October last year. Um, and I think they're trying to do exactly that, you know, they're trying to remind everyone because, you know, in hacktivism, for example, we've seen this mass mobilization, of course, just after the war began against, against Ukraine, we've seen this mass mobilization and we have seen Ukraine utilizing, you know, of course, all the, all the forces that they can get to defend off the enemy, but that also went both ways, pro-Russian and 
pro-Ukraine. And um, I think the publication that they did was uh, great. And uh, I know that, you know, some of those hacktivist groups like the, um, the Army of Ukraine, they really live by, by, the, by those rules now. So I think it was a great reminder to everyone that you can't just, you know, defend your country. There are actually rules in place. And they say that in the publication also, cyberspace is not a lawless space if a state is not able to enforce the law at the moment in war or even not in war, there's always going to be international humanitarian law. Um, so uh, I wanted to focus, I, actually, mm -hmm. I wanted to pivot to hacktivism. It's great that you that you brought it up because you've done a lot of work yeah. in this area too. And yeah. this has been, I know that um, I think Intel 471 helped a bit with that report with some of these, because we follow a lot of hacktivist groups and mm -hmm. um, their telegram channels and what they're announcing and sort of what they're doing. Can you tell me sort of like, how is this, how should we view hacktivism? Because there's, there's two angles, I guess. One is sort of the technical disruption angle, which seems like we've largely solved it like you can just you know get a scrubbing service and get bigger bandwidth and sometimes there's really big attacks that kind of catch people off guard but generally it's like a thing that we can deal with versus like 10 or 12 years ago when it was even more disruptive and then there's just sort of like the attention and and uh that's given to these groups that are doing this that, that you write in the report that there's outsized attention focused mm -hmm. on this that can be leveraged for sort of like political gain and image gain. Tell me a little bit about um, what your yeah, analyst team yeah. wrote about that. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm very, my head is right now deep into, into hacktivism and it's like almost like a rabbit hole that you can't get, get out, get out of. Um, because again, I, I, I think there, there are things that you can zoom, zoom into, uh, but also I think from, for me at least, I don't know if it is because of my background. I need, for example, definitions. What is hacktivism really? How has that changed over time? You know, hacktivism as ransomware, for example, has been, it's, it's nothing new, you know, it has been around for some time. But with ransomware, for example, we've seen fundamental changes in 2022 when double extortion came. And now with hacktivism, yes. It's, it's the same almost. I haven't really come to an agreement with myself and, you know, others uh, really. Um, to, to, you know, to find out what is it that is so different, that feels so different to what we're seeing, because, you know, like classical or traditional hacktivism is, you know, like you book, you boycotting someone, web defacement, DDoS, of course, yes. um, virtual sit-ins organization, and then you can, you could look at activism so uh, like a non-disruptive way of using technology for a common cause you could look at hacktivism so hacking methods it wants to disrupt but does not want to cause harm and then we have today's activity and it's it's very hard to to put in those because when we say okay not really sure if, if that is the hacktivism what we're observing because we do see some groups um, that are causing harm um, for example, predatory sparrow or cyber adventures that are actually addressing or attacking OT, not just IT systems, for example. Um, but then what you're some, mentioning- some dipping into criminal activity as well, right? Because we, yeah. we kind of see some groups kind of wobble between, or at least threat actors that are kind of in groups, wobble between interesting, very criminal things versus just sort of the kind of traditional sort of hacktivist things too. So sometimes yeah. I guess it's difficult to see who, you know, which, which <laughs> they're weaving a line sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really difficult. It's very blurry lines. And again, yeah, activism is no crime, you know, so then when do they, you know, when do they cross the line? Um, and um so what we've been doing in the Navigator report with the help of, of you guys, actually, and I was, I was super happy to, to work with the data that we received from you, um, where we looked at pro-Russian hacktivism, um, because at the time of analysis and data collection, the other, the other conflict, so um, Israel-Hamas, hasn't happened yet. So now we actually see, you know, another conflict happening and very similar activities there, many, many groups joining their sites. Um, and but then I think, the... sorry to interrupt, I just had a question about that because when, so the, uh, when the action happened in, between Israel and, and Palestine, um, mm -hmm. that hacktivism hasn't been quite as vigorous, I think. Is, is that how the report termed it as what happened between Russia and Ukraine? Like those hacktivist groups were, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if more active is the way to describe it or. 
yeah, it's uh, it's difficult because um, the, um, the I think the volume of groups actually exceeded uh, the Russia Ukraine war. So we've seen much more activity uh, in Palestine Israel. Um, but then I think uh, what I mentioned with uh, impacting OT, we've actually also seen much more in Palestine Israel conflict than we have seen in the other one. So it really depends on again what angle are you looking at? Are we looking at impact of IT or OT, uh, do, we, do we look at um, uh, only IT systems, then what I haven't mentioned yet is also the, the impact of what you mentioned, you know, the, the cognitive attacks really, you know, the cognitive sides of it. Uh, and uh, when we looked at pro-Russian uh, hackivist groups last year, we focused on, on two specifically uh, because they actually impacted our business areas quite a lot. And as also the Nordics where I'm actually Based. I'm based in Sweden. Um, and by tracking that, we actually found that most likely what we have been observing last year must have been a much bigger information campaign than people were aware of. Because we actually saw like an interplay between physical and cyber space events that directly impacted each other, or even, how do you say, like even amplified each other. And these were um, with Russian uh, sympathetic groups? Exactly. Yeah. So Anonymous Sudan and uh, uh, No Name. Uh, and then we also saw at times when something happened in, in Sweden last year, we've, we've seen a lot of uh, Quran burnings here uh, that fueled into the cyber space and the hacktivism that we then actually saw um, collectives joining each other. And then we had like five different hacktivist groups that would join a campaign like of Sweden or of France or of Australia. Actually, there was a fashion show last year, like almost a year ago, where Anonymous Sudan reacted on. Um, so yeah, that's that's something where where we, we say we can have the discussion of okay, but what impact does it do from a technical perspective? It's yes. just a few DDoS attacks, you know. Uh, and again, uh, I, I think that is quite ignorant to do it like this, first of all, depending on which business you are. A few minutes, half an hour, several hours downtime can mean a lot. Um, but then I think it's uh, it's so much more than that, because especially here in the Nordics, for example, we saw um, we saw that this reached the public, you know, and the perception yes. of the public became are, are we being under attack um, by pro-Russian hacktivist groups? And as a consequence, actually, both countries here, Denmark and Sweden, changed their policies. Um, Sweden actually increased the uh, terror threat level from three to four, and Denmark uh, implemented uh, or introduced a bill, uh, so it is now illegal to burn uh, religious scripts. So, so it, it had a very been. strong effect on policy. Yeah, then yeah. too. And yeah. I guess in the first example, too, they felt a tangible threat by raising um, or changing the terrorist sort of warning level. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, looking at both actually hacktivism and ransomware, as I do, what I notice when I ask myself a little bit like, okay, what, what is it that's so different? What is it that is so impactful? And I think it comes down to the entry point of both of those cyber aggressions um you know through technology um, now we have ready-made services and tools to rent out and it really lowers the entry point uh, again you know the publication by the international committee of the red cross uh, highlights that as well we see mess we see the volume of it uh, as we see you know with ransomware cyber extortion and hacktivism as well and the impact then is that it reaches a lot of people uh you know that before we're not really aware of of brands and where or hacktivism. Yes, yes. And, uh, I guess if you're a so if your company like, what do you tell companies that come to you and say, what's the risk of hacktivism to me? Mm -hmm. Are they kind of obsessed with the technical details of it when mm -hmm. that may not be as important as sort of like this attack is going to reflect badly on your brand mm -hmm. because it's going to result in media headlines and this group is going to make a big splash. And again, it's, it's sort of like, again, less the technical effects, but more of the perception, I guess, of, exactly. of as you say, reputation, information campaign also. And again, here it's very similar to what I said before, the char characteristic of your industry might actually determine whether or not you're being DDoSed or not by those, um, but I guess that I'm observing because 
you know, transportation, ports, uh, airports are continuously DDoSed, uh, financial sector is continuously DDoSed, government sites. Uh, so then it, it doesn't really, you know, matter matter your victim variables in that sense, but the industry that you're in, and just to show that this, you know, from their point of view, they're just showing uh, this has a big impact, it's being picked up by media and so on. And the language is very unproportional also, like I knew Sudan, especially when we observed them last year, and they've been declaring cyber war four times on different organizations or countries, but what does it really mean, you know, what they've done uh, actually, you know? Yeah, yes. I think I think they hit the state of Alabama in the U.S. Uh, last week, which which at least, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of looked at it and it was like, why? Why Alabama? And I mean, it was just mm -hmm. because of they said because of U.S. support for Israel. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of one of the common reasons, I guess, why these why these things are executed. Um, I was just going to read back to you a line from the uh Orange Cyber Defense, the Navigator report that I thought was really, really good. Um, it says targeting can be highly opportunistic, uh, which exacerbates the technical asymmetry. Uh, it says in conventional attacks, it's already said that the attacker only has to be lucky once. This is even more true with hacktivism, where any successful technical operation can be turned into political collateral. Perception mm -hmm. is contagious, so even the slightest technical success can spawn ballooning political consequences. I thought that was really well written and really summed mm -hmm. it up well. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, again, both hacktivism and uh, ransomware is super opportunistic. And, uh, you know, our industry loves to talk about targeting, but, you know, observing both of them, I don't really... I think we can say that, um, but what we can look at is, you know, how how cyberspace has has changed as as a whole. And uh, I don't know, do we still have enough time? You know, like to dive. I can explain a little bit more what what I'm meaning. Go uh, ahead. Take a few minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sure. <laughs> um, because uh, you know, in criminology, we we look at okay, so why why does crime happen? And we have several frameworks, several theories to look at, you know, either, either the threat actor themselves or the environment they're in or just like different factors. So there's one framework which is called routine activity theory, uh, in short, RET. Um, and uh, it's a very, really helpful one, a very straightforward one, because you just need to imagine a triangle of three uh, three factors that determine crime or the likelihood of crime to occur. And that is yes. a motivated defender, uh, a victim, uh, and uh, like a suitable victim and the lack of a guardian. So if, when all three meet, then that is um, that is when crime occurs or the likelihood is very high. But the makers or, you know, the people that made the theory in 1979 began, uh, they were tasked to understand why in 1979 there was a high crime rate in the US. Um, and what they found actually was that the normal, deter term the normal variables to determine crime, like high unemployment rate, low education, didn't really you know, seem to be present. It was the opposite. And they needed to find new ways of explaining that high crime rate. Right. They started to look a little bit more into structural patterns, really, that might determine uh, the crime patterns that they are observing. And what they found was actually that the daily routines of people had changed, and that determined what they saw. So in 1979, what happened, you know, as a society as a whole was that um, uh, that uh, women actually started to enter the labor market, and they left houses and properties unprotected. So there was an unprotected okay. space left alone, sounds familiar to cyberspace, I think. Uh, and then uh, at the same time, we had already some digital transformation where home appliances became smaller and smaller and more introduced to the general public. So radio and TV, for example. So there was something of value in that unprotected space that could now yes. be you know, stolen more easily. So that's kind of created a whole space of opportunities. And that's exactly what we see, I think, as you know, ransomware and hacktivism right now. It's just very opportunistic. And you can, you know, you can kind of make the narrative um, like the threat actors do, you know, the impact that they're having, the, the reasons why. But at the end, it's just extremely opportunistic because we are connected somehow to the internet and we have an attack surface. Hmm. Great. Well, Deanna. 
thank you so much for joining me and thank you very much for those insights. Yeah, thank you for talking to you, uh, Jeremy. It was a pleasure.